an astrophysical and geophysical uh, fluid dynamicist. Um, she did a PhD in DAMPT uh, with uh, Nigel Weiss and Douglas Goss on the dynamics of the tachycline. She then, after a postdoc in Cambridge, well, fellowship in Cambridge, I guess, uh, she then moved to the University of Santa Cruz, where she's been ever since. Uh, Pascal has done seminal work. Thank you, Nick. Pascal has done seminal work in uh, low Prandtl number dynamics and double diffusive processes, uh, as well as the interactions of shear and rotation. Uh, she's also managing to be in two places at once because at the minute she's running the Cavli program, uh, summer program in astrophysics, which is a, a great thing and, and I guess very similar to the festival, but for, in astrophysics. And today, Pascal is going to talk to us about, I think, low Prandtl number dynamics. So over to you, Pascal. Thanks a lot. And uh, let me try and find how to share my screen. OK, is that visible to everybody? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK, so thanks for the organizers of the festival to invite me. It's the first time I actually participate to my great shame. I, I always seem to be doing other things at this time of the year, but because of the virtual program, I can be in two places at once for once. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and tell you about some of our, our work on shear instabilities at low parental number. And this is some work that started at the Woods Hole Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Summer Program at HUI. And uh, it involved a lot of people, uh, including Basile Gallet, Tobias Bichot, Flojiton Kulenti Raja, Damien Gagné, Jan Verhoeven, Laura Cope, and Colm Caulfield. Um, and this work is funded by the National Science Foundation. I should not forget to mention this. So one of my long-term research goals that kind of motivates all of my work is to quantify turbulent mixing in stars and to do so using experience that is gained from geophysical fluid dynamics, both in terms of the mathematical techniques and the numerical tools that they use in that field. And for that, the Woods Hole GFD program has been a source of inspiration throughout the years. So you might ask, if you're not in the stellar astrophysics community, why do we care about turbulent mixing in stars? And the reason is, um, that we don't actually understand stars too well. I mean, on the great lines, we do. The standard stellar model is uh, very simple, but very good at explaining the observations in the great lines. So the structure of that model is uh, just a 1D model. It's spherically symmetric. It assumes hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, but on the other hand, it has very sophisticated microphysics, including equations for radiative transfer, calculation of opacities, computation of the equation of state, uh, and nuclear reactions. And all of these are derived from uh, models uh, of plasma physics. Um, on the other hand, by comparison, the basic, the fluid dynamics that are used in these models are extremely basic. And basically it involves a very simple mixing length prescription for convective mixing and very little else. Now, with that in mind, the model is very successful at explaining the general properties of say the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram which is shown here for the galaxy, which shows luminosity as a function of color for all these stars. And this line here is the main sequence. These are here, the, the giant stars. And with the standard stellar model, we can explain why there is a main sequence and why these stars exist. But if you go beyond these uh, very basic observations, what we have now, uh, especially in the last 40 years is detailed spectrometry and spectroscopy as well as uh, helio and astro seismology. And these are really challenging our understanding of stellar interiors. And in particular, um, one of the things that is really starting to jar with a standard model are measurements and observations of surface abundances of certain chemical species, as well as measurements of subsurface flows like differential rotation and meridional circulations that cannot be explained by the standard model. And what Astrophysicists usually do is wave their hands and say turbulent mixing is needed in the stably stratified part of the star, which is normally excluded in the model. Um, and they have some very basic prescriptions for this mixing. But my goal is to really try and bring some more rigorous approach to the problem and actually compute these turbulent mixing coefficients from first principles through our understanding of fluid dynamics. And let me give you a few examples of where there is this discrepancy between models and observations. 
So for example, one of the most famous one and which was the subject of my PhD thesis is these measurements of the interior solar rotation profile, which is shown here on the right. I'm sure you've seen this if you've chatted with Pat or Nick or anybody or to Steve. Um, this is the rotation profile of the sun. This is the surface. This dashed line is the base of the convection zone. Uh, the, uh, here the equator is rotating rapidly, the poles in the convection zone are rotating slowly, and you have this very famous transition region at the base of the convection zone, which is this strong radial shear layer called the tachocline. And just as a first order thing, the existence of the tachocline itself cannot be explained by the standard solar model. But more interestingly, to some extent, is the fact that helioseismology can measure the sound speed in the sun as a function of radius. And one of the main discoveries is that the models are not doing very well in the region of the tachocline. And this is illustrated in this figure. This a delta C squared is the difference between the model and the observations or the observations of the model divided by the sound speed in the model <coughs> squared. And you can see that although in general the error is very small, it is nonetheless non-zero and has a bump below the base of the convection zone in the region just below the solar tachocline. And this is now really thought to be missing physics in the solar model. Paper, there's an argument made that the stratification of the solar model is not correctly taken into account and they make an attempt to do so. Another uh, big result of the last 10 years is the discovery of differential rotation in red giant branch stars. And uh, this is this very nice paper by De et al. in 2014 that shows the rotation rate of both the core of the red giant star and the envelope of the red giant star as a function of surface gravity, which is a proxy for time or evolution along the red giant branch. And as you can see, the core spins up and the envelope spins down. And observationally, they find that the ratio of the core to envelope rotation rates is a factor of 10. Now, this is actually quite different from what would be predicted by angular momentum conservation in the standard stellar model. This is now a paper looking at the evolution of the same quantities, the core rotation rate and the envelope rotation rate as a function of time in these red giant branch or actually throughout the entire stellar evolution, but focusing in the inset here on what happens on the red giant branch, which is what's shown here. And you can see that in these standard models, the ratio of core to envelope is predicted to be of order 10 to the four. So there's a factor of a thousand difference between what the model predicts and what we actually observe. So again, that's an evidence for some mixing turbulent, missing mixing, or missing turbulent mixing, presumably, or perhaps magnetic torques, but we don't know what to do with magnetic fields usually. So let's just say missing turbulent mixing. And in general, in these examples I gave, um, you can see that there appears to be some correspondence between um, the regions of stars where we know there's shear and the regions of stars where we know there's missing physics. And this correspondence is presumably, or at least I'm coming at the problem with the notion that this correspondence is probably not a coincidence and ask the question whether the missing mixing could be due to shear induced turbulence. Because of course, turbulence mixes chemical species, which would address some of these surface abundance problems. And it also transports angular momentum, which might address some of these angular momentum transport problems. And so the questions we need to be able to answer from first principles when we wanna study shear induced turbulence is whether one, the shear is unstable in the first place, and to how much mixing it eventually causes. And in this talk, I'll talk about two types of shear, the vertical shear and the horizontal shear in part one and two. And all of this, in doing all of this, we need to bear in mind that this has to be done at low Prandtl number because stars are low Prandtl number fluids. Uh, this here on the right is a figure showing the Prandtl number as a function of radius in lots of different stars with various masses. So this here is a 0.7 solar mass star all the way to a 30 solar mass star shown here. 
and everything in between are just intermediate masses between these two extremes. And you can see that regardless of what you do, the Prandtl number is going to be very small. And we're thinking about something on the lines of 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six in the regions of the star that are uh, radiatively stratified. And as I'll demonstrate in this talk, low Prandtl number dynamics are very interesting because they open a whole new region of parameter space uh, with very interesting dynamics that are not observed in geophysical flows. And so uh, with that in mind, let me then start with talking about vertical shear instabilities. And this is how I got into the problem, hence my choice to show this first. So just the, having this in mind, I'm thinking about looking at vertical shear, say in red giant branch stars, or in the solar tackle climb below the base of the convection zone. So I don't know if there's many students in the audience, but just in case, um, uh, one of the way to understand uh, vertical shear instabilities is to look at their energetics. And so suppose you have a, a region of fluid shown here, which is stably stratified, and I'm representing this by the color here. So imagine cold at the bottom, and dense at the bottom and hot at the top, so less dense at the top, with two parcels of fluid moving at different rates. So this is the shear. And then imagine there's a mixing event. And in the mixing event, the density and the momenta of these parcels of fluid are both equalized. So after the interchange, there's no longer any shear and there's no longer any stratification. And you can look at whether this mixing event has either extracted energy from the background state or has given energy to the background state. And to do so, you can compute the rate of change of potential energy from the start to the end and the rate of change of the kinetic energy from the start to the end. And if the potential energy cost is bigger than the kinetic energy you gain from the exchange, then the turbulence will die out. On the other hand, if the potential energy cost is less than the kinetic energy you gain from the exchange, then you actually have a net positive amount of energy left at the end that you can use to continue doing more mixing down the line. And the ratio of the potential energy cost to the kinetic energy gain is given by the ratio of the buoyancy frequency squared divided by the shearing rate squared. And this buoyancy frequency squared is basically related to the background density gradient. And this ratio is a famous ratio called the Richardson number. And this energetic argument for the maintenance of turbulence in a stratified fluid uh, for non-diffusive shear flows was first given by Richardson in the 1920s. And it basically says exactly what I just said, is that for maintaining turbulence in a stratified fluid, you need that Richardson number to be smaller than the quantity of order unity. And this was uh, later, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say justified, but mathematically speaking, one can derive a similar criterion for linear instability in stratified shear flows, and that was done by Miles and Howard in 1961. And they found that for instability, for linear instability, one needs the Richardson number to be smaller than a quarter somewhere in the fluid. And you also need a potential vorticity maximum or an inflection point. But these two criteria are different. This one is an energetic one where this is a formal linear stability analysis. So this one could also apply to nonlinear instabilities where this one is just linear. Now, this is actually bad news for stellar mixing because in the vast majority of stars, the Richardson number is actually much, much greater than one. In the, the solar tackle line, for example, you can compute an estimate of the Richardson number and you'll find something on the order of a thousand. And in these red giant branch stars, you'll find something on the order of a million. So these are definitely not subject to the standard shear instabilities. But does that rule vertical shear instabilities in stars completely? And the answer is because stars are low Prandtl number fluids, and I'll get back to that, uh, this is not necessarily true. You can actually have vertical shear instabilities. And the chink in the argument of Richardson and uh, the standard Richardson criterion is that it assumes that the fluid motions are adiabatic so that there's no exchange of energy between the parcel, sorry, there's no exchange of thermal energy between the parcels in the background during the fluid motion. But if the motion is very slow, um, then the parcels can adjust thermally to the background 
as they move and that, that reduces their buoyancy with respect to the background and helps the instability. And that was demonstrated by Townsend for radiative adjustment and discussed by Zahn in 74 for diffusive adjustment. And the picture now is the following. So before the interchange, this was the picture that we had before, but if the event is a slow mixing event, then after the interchange, you haven't changed the background density profile at all. And so there was no potential in energy cost and you only have kinetic energy gain. And as a result, the instability is always energetically favorable. So to demonstrate how this works in practice and mathematically, let's consider a very simple setup. We have a linear shear flow as shown here together with a stably stratified fluid. Again, so dense at the bottom, less dense at the top with say the background temperature gradient that is positive. And just for the sake of argument here, um, we're gonna assume this setup is linearly stable because we have a linear shear here. Because I wanna ignore linear instability for the moment. Now, these model equations are, if, sorry, the equations that describe the model are the Navier-Stokes equations, incompressibility, we're gonna assume a Boussinesque fluid for simplicity, and the thermal energy equation, uh, where you see the advection of the temperature perturbations, T, and the advection of the background entropy gradient or temperature gradient minus the adiabatic temperature gradient uh, in this term here, and then the diffusion of the temperature fluctuations here. And somehow uh, a constant shear is applied and that can easily be done by using a plain stratified quet flow problem between two moving boundaries, or it can be done by applying uh, a shearing box model where the entire thing is uh, periodic sheared boundaries. Or you can assume that there is a force added to that equation that at each time makes the flow relax to a linear state a linear shear profile. Anyway, so somehow we have a linear shear. Now we can non-dimensionalize these equations. So let's use uh, the st standard unit velocity might, might be the length scale times the shear. That length scale might be the height of the box. And then we have a unit temperature that's defined by this uh, temperature gradient. And so with that, these are the non-dimensional equations here. And we see three important parameters pop up, which are the standard parameters. We have the Reynolds number here, which in these, uh, note, with this choice of units is basically the shearing rate times L squared over nu. We have a Peclet number, which is very similar, but with a thermal diffusivity at the bottom. And the Richardson number pops up here in front of the temperature fluctuation in the buoyancy term. So, just a few words on the Peclet numbers. This, this is not necessarily something people use a lot. So like I said, it's the equivalent of the Reynolds number, but using thermal diffusion. And so the Peclet number measures how thermally not diffusive the flow is. In other words, when the Peclet number is very small, thermal diffusion is very important. And um, in geophysical fluid dynamics, we rarely ever consider the case of low Peclet number because when the Prandtl number is of order one, which is the case for water and air and most usual earth fluids, um, because the Peclet number is the Prandtl times Reynolds, if Prandtl is of order one, then Peclet number is of order Reynolds. And so the limit Peclet much smaller than one is completely equivalent to the Reynolds number much smaller than one, which means you can't have turbulence. So we never talk about low Peclet number in um, earthly fluids because these are essentially laminar flows and so you can't have turbulence and be low Peclet number at the same time. In stars with the Prandtl number as small as the one I showed you earlier, it is possible to have both a very large Reynolds number and a very small Peclet number. So for example, consider um, Prandtl number is 10 to the minus six, say, then you can have Peclet number of 0.01 and Reynolds of 10 to the four, which is quite large. So this is a limit that is indeed of interest in astrophysics. And so you can have thermally diffusive turbulence. Now, this limit of turbulence in a thermally diffusive environment was already considered by Ed Spiegel in 62, 
in the context of low parental number thermal convection. But that never quite worked. And it's only later that Francois Linier showed that this is a very useful limit for stellar radiation zones, um, even if it's not really useful in, for stellar convection zones. And what he showed is that when the Peclet number is much smaller than one, these governing equations here can be asymptotically reduced in the formal asymptotic sense. Um, and these two terms here in the thermal energy equation can be neglected and the thermal energy balance becomes just these two terms. So the balance between the vertical advection of the background temperature gradient and the diffusion of the temperature fluctuations. And so these two, the vertical velocity fields and the temperature fluctuations are not exactly slave to one another through this equation. And in fact, you can solve for the temperature fluctuation in favor of W and plug this back into the momentum equation. And what you get is this reduced asymptotically exact uh, momentum equation, which uh, in where the temperature fluctuations disappear entirely. So you no longer need that thermal energy equation. So that's convenient because you now only have a single equation to solve rather than two. It also has other interesting properties. Notably, you can see that the only parameters that appear now is the combination of Richardson times Peclet. So this is a property of these low Peclet equation is that the relevant stratification parameter is the Richardson times the Peclet number rather than the Richardson number on its own. And if you go back to the dimensional version of that equation, it looks like this. And so you can see that the relevant dimensional measure of per the relevant dimensional measure of stratification is n squared over kappa t rather than n squared on its own. So these two dimensional numbers should always appear together in a thermally diffusive fluids. And that's gonna be really important from what I'm gonna say later. Now, another important property of these low Peclet equations that, and you can derive that property by taking a horizontal average of the remaining balance in the thermal energy equation. So W bar is the horizontally average vertical flow. T bar is the horizontally average temperature. And so this is telling you that this balance holds, but if you don't have any net vertical flow through your system, this is also zero. And that tells you that the background temperature has to be linear and must remain the same as that of the background. So in essence, the stratification in this limit is completely unaffected by turbulence. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because this is exactly the picture that I drew here, right? So for slow enough mixing, we're not affecting the background stratification. But it's quite important to note that this is indeed the property of this low Peclet number turbulence. Now, there are several important consequences of the fact that n squared over kappa t is the only relevant dimensional parameter or dimensional combination of parameters in the system. First and foremost, you can see that the stability criterion for vertical shear instabilities in this diffusive limit it can't be Richardson number smaller than a critical number because Richardson number is n squared over s squared. And so that does not involve that combination n squared over kappa t. So instead, we need to cook up a criterion that knows about n squared over kappa t. And if you think about it a little bit, the only way to do it is to take n squared over kappa t. And now I wanna create a non-dimensional number out of it. I wanna involve the shear somehow because it's a shear instability. And the only way to do that is to multiply this by nu over s squared. And this is indeed the only non-dimensional combination of parameters that involve both n squared over kappa t and the shearing rate that you can create from that. And that gives you a new criterion for instability, which is that the Richardson, so you can now combine the n squared over s squared to get j, the nu over kappa t to get the parental number, and so the new criterion for instability in this diffusive limit ought to be Richardson Prantor is smaller than some critical value. Now we've arrived at this just from dimensional argument, but there's a very nice derivation of this criterion from physical principles by Jean-Paul Zahn in 1974. And I really encourage you to read it. It's very easy. 
um, and very nice. But he arrives at the same conclusion here. And note that the appearance of the viscosity here suggests that viscosity plays a role in the stabilization. And indeed, that's the case. So if you do the numerical simulations, you find that the stabilization does depend on the viscosity. So um, that one of the very first things we worked on in this field was to indeed test Jean Paul Zahn's criterion uh, against direct numerical simulations. And that followed work by Vincent Pratt and Francois Linière in 2013 and 14. Um, and what's interesting is that we all use different types of direct numerical simulations. So they used uh, initially a box with a forcing that relaxed the shear towards the linear profile at every time step. Um, we used a plain stratified quet flow, and then later others used a shearing box with, uh, I believe, the Snoopy code. So this is a snapshot of our simulation. So we have the top box going to the top boundary going to the left, the bottom boundary going to the right. And this was an example at Reynolds number 10 to the 5 and Richardson Peckley of 83. Now, in all of these efforts, we basically have the same approach. We take a turbulent simulation and gradually increase the stratification until the turbulence dies. And this, these are the results. So these are the results on the left from uh, Pratt et al. in 2016 using shearing box simulations. On the right, these are our own results from 2017 using the stratified plane quet flow. Uh, on the y-axis, there is a measure of the turbulent diffusivity that is non-dimensionalized. Uh, and it's the same quantity in both figures. And on the x-axis is just a Richardson times Prantle. And different symbols here and there correspond to different Reynolds numbers for the simulations. And first and foremost, the two uh, sets of simulations are completely consistent with one another. You could actually overlap these two figures if you wanted. And what's interesting is you find that the turbulence essentially dies when the product of the Richardson and the Prentzel number reaches about 0 0.007. So here and here. Um, and so this, uh, and, and this was, like I said, obtained for lots of different types of direct numerical simulations with the same end result is that this is indeed the threshold for uh, stability. And note that this is not a linear stability threshold. Remember, all of these are linearly stable simulations. Um, so this is a, a nonlinear stability threshold. OK. So beyond that, you can also use dimensional analysis to estimate a number of other things. So starting from the assumption that the only two parameters you care about are the shearing rate, and that stratification parameter n squared over kappa t, you can compute a vertical eddy scale. And that combination here is the only way to create a length scale from n squared over kappa t and the shearing rate. And that length scale is now called the Zahn scale. And it was proposed again using physical arguments by Zahn in 92. And you can also compute an estimate for turbulent diffusivity from dimensional analysis. Again, assuming that the only two quantities you want to use are n squared over kappa t and the shearing rate squared. So these are therefore the only possible way of creating a turbulent diffusivity with these parameters. And again, this is what was proposed by Zahn in 92, although not using dimensional analysis. And both of these scalings are tentatively seen in our direct numerical simulations. Um, although with some caveats. And the DNS can be used to actually measure the proportionality constants here and here. And if you're interested, you can look at some of our papers. So overall, um, these DNS can both verify that these are the correct length scale and this is the correct criterion. And so we have, I think, a pretty good handle on these vertical shear instabilities in stars. Now, going back to these uh, motivation, then we can see what that predicts for mixing in stars. So remember in the tachocline, the Richardson number was about a thousand. In red giant branch star, the Richardson number was about a million. So Richardson Prantle with Prantle of about 10 to the minus six 
In the tachocline, that would be about 10 to the minus three. So it's indeed possibly unstable to these vertical shear instabilities. But for red giant branch stars, uh, Richards and Prantle would be of order one. So these are not unstable to the vertical shear instability. And you can also plug in that formula for the turbulent mixing in, um, in uh, the case of the tachocline, which is possibly unstable. And you find that this turbulent mixing coefficient is about a thousand times smaller than the thermal diffusivity, which is itself about a thousand times larger. Um, and, and because the thermal diffusivity is 10 to the six times larger than the viscosity, the turbulent diffusivity is about a thousand times larger than the viscosity for the tachocline. So mixing is a little bit more efficient than microscopic diffusivity by a factor of say a thousand. Um, so that's quite a lot, but as we'll see, that's nowhere near as much as what you'd get for horizontal shear instabilities. So the bottom line is vertical shear instabilities might be relevant in the solar tachocline, definitely not in red giant branch stars. And now we're gonna see that in the case of horizontal shear instabilities, uh, the shear is actually even more relevant than in the vertical shear case. So let's now look at horizontal shear instabilities. So the, this is, a, again, this picture of the tachocline, and it demonstrates that below the base of the convection zone, you can indeed have horizontal shear. It's rotating a little bit more rapidly here in the equatorial region than here in the polar regions. You also have a number of stellar models that predict some amount of latitudinal shear in stars due to angular momentum conservation and meridional flows. So basically horizontal shear of some level or another is expected in stars. So one might ask whether it's unstable or not. And the first thing is that horizontal shear can always be unstable to two dimensional, so that is vertically invariant perturbations. And these perturbations are not affected by the stratification at all because they're purely horizontal motions. And so the shear instabilities can develop very easily in 2D. But of course, these 2D perturbations have no vertical flow by definition, otherwise the stratification would affect them. And so a priori, you get no vertical mixing from purely 2D perturbations. But this is where uh, in the same famous paper as the vertical shear paper in 92, Jean-Paul proposed a model for vertical mixing by horizontal shear. And the model works this way. Suppose you have a horizontal shear. I'm sorry, it's not a very pretty picture, but this is my horizontal shear. That horizontal shear creates purely two-dimensional instabilities that are vertically invariant like this, okay? And... Um, these then create these horizontal vortices at each layer. Now, because the flow is very low viscosity, these horizontal vortices might lose coherence in the vertical and start slipping horizontally at different depths, okay? And so at different depths, you might start now having vortice, vortices are out of phase with one another. And that generates vertical shear between these horizontal planes. And the vertical shear, if the scale in the vertical is small enough, this vertical shear might be diffusive if you have high enough thermal diffusivity. And that would then cause vertical mixing from the diffusive shear flows that are generated. And Zahn argued that there's a direct relationship between the vertical mixing induced by this phenomenon and the horizontal mixing induced by this phenomenon and that the vertical mixing coefficient is basically proportional to the ratio of the shearing rate in the, in the horizontal over the buoyancy frequency times the geometric mean of the horizontal mixing coefficient times the thermal diffusivity. And there's a physical argument behind the scaling. So what we set out to do is to verify whether first that qualitative picture is correct and second, whether that scaling is correct. And this started as a GFD project um, with Laura Cope and Colm Caulfield at the GFD summer school again. So for this particular um, set of investigations, we looked again at a vertically stratified fluid. So this is the temperature profile here, which is linear. And this time we applied a body force 
in the system, the body force drives a horizontal flow in the X direction that varies in the Y direction and that is invariant in the Z direction. So this is exactly this kind of exact 2D, sheer, um, 2D horizontal flow. And this setup, by contrast with the one I discussed in the context of the vertical shear instability, this setup is now linearly unstable. And the first modes that grow are these vertically invariant modes, okay? And they cause a meandering of this jet. Um, the non-dimensional equations for this system look very much like the ones we had before. This time, the shear, I use the shear length scale as the scale of the flow. And uh, velocity u that is obtained by balancing the nonlinear advection term in the horizontal direction to the forcing. So that gives me an estimate of the amplitude of the shear at, or the amplitude of the flow at saturation. And so we have the same Reynolds and Peckley number coming up based on these two scales. And something like a buoyancy parameter, it's not a Richardson number because it doesn't involve any vertical shear but it does have a similar shape. So it's n squared over say the horizontal shearing rate squared. Now, just for reference, um, using the observed shearing rate and the observed flow amplitude in the solar tachocline, you can compute an estimate of the Reynolds, Peclet and buoyancy parameters. And you find that the Reynolds is huge, the Peclet is huge and the buoyancy parameter is huge. So these are all very large numbers in the solar tachocline. And the ratio of Peclet to Reynolds is the frontal number. And as I said before, it's of order 10 to the minus six. So this is definitely not a priori a low Peclet number flow. And it's really important to remember that. But on the other hand, it is a low frontal number flow. So in the DNS I'm going to show you, we're going to use a frontal number smaller than one. So these are some sample simulations that we obtained. Um, these are all at Reynolds number equals 600 here and here. Um, so very high Reynolds number, at least high for our code. Um, relatively high Peclet number, Peclet number 60, so that the frontal number is 0.1 in both cases. And on the left, this is a moderately stratified simulation. And on the right, it's a strongly stratified simulation. So the B number, the stratification parameter has increased from 10 to 100 between the left and the right. The top shows the streamwise velocity and the bottom shows the vertical velocity. And in both cases, you see that the forcing is generating a strong horizontal flow, but that this horizontal flow has meanders. You can see it here and here. And these meanders are vertically decoupled from one another, which creates this layering in the vertical direction. And as the stratification increases, the vertical size of the layers, I shouldn't call them layers, these are not density layers, they're just velocity layers. The vertical size of these layers is decreasing significantly. And that causes shear in the vertical direction um, that creates this vertical flow. So here you can see it for low stratification and for higher stratification. And you can see that the vertical size of the eddies is becoming much smaller. You can also see the beginning of some intermittency in here at high stratification. So quantitatively speaking, this really recovers Zahn's idea of these um, horizontally, horizontal vortices that are decoupled in the vertical, generating vertical shear that then becomes turbulent on the smaller scale. But what about quantitatively speaking? So what we did is to compute the length scale, the vertical length scale of eddies in the simulation, the RMS vertical velocity in the simulation, and the RMS temperature fluctuation in the simulation as a function of the buoyancy parameter B, ranging from 10 to the minus two to 10 to the four in each case, um, with different colors showing different frontal number simulations and the size and shape of the symbols corresponding to the Reynolds number. And for now, I just want you to focus on the square simulations, the square symbols, which are the largest Reynolds number. This gray region here is for very low stratification. Here, you just recover the unstratified limit. So what's of interest is what happens in the more strongly stratified cases. So B is 10 or 100, like I showed you earlier. And what you can see is that 
the length scale decreases as the stratification increases, like we saw in the snapshots. Similarly, the vertical velocity decreases, the temperature fluctuation decrease. But more interestingly, you can also see the emergence of some scaling laws. The length scale is found to scale roughly as b to the minus a third in this intermediate region of the domain. W is going like b to the minus a third as well. And the temperature fluctuations go like b to the minus 2 thirds. There are also some open symbols here where the scaling laws clearly don't apply, and I'll talk about them in a minute. So we have these scaling laws, and let's just see whether we can understand where they come from. So uh, what we argue is that these can be understood simply from dominant balance arguments in the governing equations. So let's start with a horizontal momentum equation. In this equation, the forcing has been non-dimensionalized to be of order one, and the velocity has been non-dimensionalized to be of order one. So all the terms in black are of order one, and we're just gonna neglect viscosity on the grounds that the Reynolds number is very high. So the RMS horizontal flow and the RMS pressure are both of order one. From the vertical momentum equation, you can pretty much throw everything else except hydrostatics, which is this equation. Um, I shouldn't call it hydrostatic. This is actually this hydrostatic for the fluctuation. So this is balance between uh, pressure gradient and, buoy and buoyancy fluctuations. And so from a dimensional argument, from a dimensional perspective, this is PRMS over LZ. This is BT. And so, you, and because PRMS was shown to be of order one, you have this here, which says that one over LZ should be BT. From the temperature uh, equation, again, because we're high Peclé number in general, we're going to neglect the temperature diffusion and uh, just have this, which shows that, say, URMS, TRMS over LZ from here, URMS of order one, so I'm going to just set it to one, and that should be of order WRMS from the balance between these two terms. And so TRMS should be LZ WRMS. And finally, from incompressibility, div u equals zero, you can split it um, between a horizontal divergence plus a vertical DWDC. And because this is of order one, this tells you that WRMS over LZ has to be of order one as well. And now you take all these equations in blue and combine them, and you get that the non-dimensional vertical scale of the eddy should scale like b to the minus a third, and the WRMS should scale like b to the minus a third, exactly as found in the DNS. So these are compelling, say, dominance argument balance, um, dominance balance arguments for these scalings. You can also compute a dimensional mixing coefficient by multiplying the vertical RMS velocity with the vertical eddy scale. So that would give you an estimate for the turbulent mixing coefficient in the vertical direction. And so the dimensional turbulent mixing coefficient divided by UL, which were our units, should be like WRMS LZ, and that's B to the minus two thirds or NL over U to the minus four thirds. So that's our prediction. Um, note that this dimensional prediction appears to be a new scaling law that I have not seen in the literature before. For example, you can see there's no dependence on the thermal diffusivity. So this is definitely not the ZAN 92 scale. And it's also not the same as the standard scaling you get in the geophysical literature, where LZ is often found to be U over N. And this is associated with the formation of density layers. And we do not find this. If we did, we would have that LZ must go like B to the minus a half times L, not minus a third times L. And we were so surprised about it. We really did look for this scaling in the simulations and have not found it. So there appears to be a new regime where this is possible at low Prandtl number. Now, let's go back to these open uh, simulations here. At some point, because the, the vertical length scale continues to decrease as you increase the buoyancy parameter, the assumption that thermal diffusion is unimportant becomes invalid. And the temperature equation, we, we can no longer neglect the thermal diffusion term. And when that happens, this is exactly what these open simulations are. It's simulation where this term becomes important. Now in practice, we can 
estimates when that happens is when the Peclin number based on the vertical scale and the vertical velocity becomes of order one. So this is when WRMSLZ over kappa t is of order one. And we computed that Peclin number and the open symbols are the ones for which this Peclin number based on the vertical scale is smaller or equal to something of order one. And you can see these are all the ones that indeed drop out of the scaling law. Now, from this formula, you can plug in what WRMS is based on these predictions, and you can plug in what LZ is based on these predictions. And so you can actually estimate that the Peckley number based on the vertical scale becomes of order one when B to the minus two thirds times the um, intrinsic, uh, the external scale Peckley number becomes of order one, or equivalently when the buoyancy parameter goes like the uh, input Peckley number to the three halves. So that leads us to this interesting regime diagram, which is essentially a summary of all our work in this limit. So here, the Peckley number increases on the left, so you become increasingly less thermally diffusive. And here, the, the, the stratification parameter increases to the right, so it becomes more strongly stratified. Um, this red line here separates regions that are not thermally diffusive to regions that are thermally diffusive. And the solar tachocline lies squarely in the non-diffusive region. So the scalings I discussed earlier should be valid there. On the other hand, for more weakly sheared stars, we should be in this low Peclay number stratified turbulence regime down here, where the Peclay number based on vertical scale of ADID is now smaller than one. So let's now take a quick look at this regime finally. So when thermal diffusion dominates, we can apply the low Peclet number equations of Francois Linier. So this gives us that in this particular model setup. And the dynamics are now governed by the product of the stratification parameter and the Peclet number. The simulations, if you run simulations in that regime, they look pretty much the same as what we had in the other regime. You have these meanders of the horizontal flow that create vertical shear. The vertical shear becomes turbulent and you have, horizontal, uh, and you have vertical flows uh, derived from that diffusive turbulence. These are similar diagrams that I showed you before, showing the vertical eddy scale, the RMS vertical velocity, the RMS temperature, but this time as a function of the product of the stratification parameter and the Peclay number. And of interest is this intermediate regime here, which is the nicely turbulent regime in the diffusive case. And now we found that the length scale goes like the BPE to the minus a third, the RMS velocity goes like BPE to the minus a six, and the TRMS goes like BPE to the minus five six times the Peclet number. And again, one can um, put forward arguments of dominant balance to understand these scalings. So from the temperature equation, this time we just keep these two terms, which gives us this expression for the RMS temperature and the RMS velocity. From the horizontal momentum equation, we get exactly the same predictions. And the main difference is in the vertical momentum equation, where this time, in order to explain the scalings, we need to keep, keep the nonlinear term in the vertical direction. And that gives us this balance between this term and BT. And combined, we then get exactly the, the observed scalings that LZ goes as BP to the minus a third, and the vertical velocity goes like BP to the minus one six. And from that, you can compute a turbulent diffusivity, and this goes as B times the Peclet number to the minus a half. And this now is exactly the prediction I gave you earlier from Zahn's 92 model for horizontal shear instabilities. So now we finally recover his regime in this diffusive regime. And there are subtle caveats to this statement that you can read in the paper. So note that this new scaling makes a complete sense from a dimensional perspective. Suppose again, you're trying to create a turbulent diffusivity or a vertical scale just from this quantity, n squared over kappa t, and from now the typical velocity of these horizontal eddies. And the only 
non-dimensional scale or the only dimensional scale you can create from that is exactly this kappa t of n squared times u to the one third. So again, just from dimensional analysis, we could have obtained the same scaling here. So just as a recap, we now have this regime diagram that I showed you earlier. On the top here, we have a turbulent viscosity that scales as so, um, and specifically like the buoyancy frequency to the minus four thirds. Down here, this is where Zahn's prediction applies, and the turbulent viscosity goes like one over n. And, and you can then apply this to the solar tackle client, for example, to compute mixing coefficients. So in the solar tackle client, we need to apply this quantity here. And you find that the turbulent mixing coefficients of order 10 to the 11 centimeters squared per second. And this is to be compared with what we obtain for the vertical shear instabilities where the, the vertical mixing coefficient for vertical shear instabilities was of order 10 to the four. So much, much larger amount of mixing coming from for vertical transport caused by horizontal shear instabilities. So horizontal shear instabilities are very relevant to cellular evolution and they're much more important than vertical shear instabilities. So to conclude, I hope I've shown that shear instabilities are important and interesting at low parental number. Um, and we've identified several regimes. Some recover what Zahn's predictions were, both in the case of vertical shear instabilities and horizontal shear instabilities. And of interest is there's a new regime that appears to not have been identified before. And very important take home message is that horizontal shear instabilities could be a really huge source of mixing in stars. They're much more easily destabilized because they're not constrained by the Richardson criterion and the transport is more efficient. And of course, the usual caveat is that we need to do more work to include other effects, including magnetic fields, rotation, and a more complex geometry in which we have both horizontal and vertical shear. And that's actually the subject of uh, Sania Khan's project in the Kavli summer program in astrophysics this summer. She's working on this right now. So with all of that, uh, thanks for your attention and I'll take some questions. Thank you, Pascal. It was a beautiful talk. Uh, we have time for some uh, questions. I know Pascal has to go in about 10 minutes. So uh, if you could raise your hand, if you have a question. Uh, to ask Pascal. Um, okay, Pat, you seem to have your hand raised. So, yes, thank you very much. Uh, two questions. You said, uh, right at the end, you said the ma the magic word. The uh, the question I had during the talk immediately was in this Zahn model of the layer of vortices. You one immediately thinks of what happens if you run a vertical magnetic field through the layers, right? And uh, how strong would that have to be to enforce coherence and otherwise spoil the party, et cetera, et cetera? Right, because the idea is it's depending upon you know relative slipping, and when when that happens with a vertical field, you're going to start bending field lines, so there'll be an energy penalty. So it, that would presumably, uh, in a sense, start to work against the mechanism. But I'm curious if anything quantitative has been nailed down. I mean, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. All of what, all of what you said is true, right? Uh, and I don't know anyone who has looked at it, at, including some of the as, attempt to quantify what's seen. I mean, I think there's been some work trying to look at turbulence with magnetic field, but not really look at comparing this to existing models. So uh, that's the next step, obviously. Uh, I would also say that rotation is going to have a similar effect, right? It's going to try and again impart some vertical coherence and reduce the vertical shear. Um, so what that does, I don't know. Well, it's a question. <laughs> it's a question of it, it's a it's a how much kind of question. It's curious. The the other thing I had is a little more philosophical, but you know I've seen many times this thing you showed at the beginning, the, the, ener the energetics argument of Richardson, which in many ways is more appealing than the linear stability crank, where we all know how, how tricky that can get. What I'm wondering, 
Has any has there ever been an attempt to go to higher order in the same spirit to try to formulate a non something like a, uh, a a stronger criterion or consider a sort of higher order in displacement, and so heading toward things like subcritical processes and so forth. So uh, I'm not sure if anybody has tried to do it in the sense you described, but I know that, for example, that was actually the work we did with Basile Gallet and Tobias Bischoff. We looked at energy stability criteria for these stratified vertical shear flows, right? Now, uh, and you know energy stability, you're trying to figure out under which conditions any perturbation dies, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so if you do this for the standard equations, you obtain nothing. The criteria you get reduces to uh, something that doesn't know about stratification. If you use the asymptotic low Peclet number equations, you get a meaningful criterion. And that criterion is of the form richardson Prentel smaller than a quarter which is interesting, right? So the, in the asymptote, and, and the reason for that is that in the low Peclet equation, the vertical velocity is slave to the temperature. So there's an extra constraint on your perturbations that allow for a more meaningful energy stability calculation. But that's the only thing I'm aware of. So this energy stability criterion for the low Peclet number dynamics, I don't know of anything else. Mm -hmm. right. Th thanks. Okay, I think Xavier was next. Well, thanks, Pascal. That was a good talk. Um, at, at some point, you were arguing on the scaling laws, you know. Uh, for instance, uh, w, w goes like B to the minus one third, the same for Z, and, and temperature was a product. Now, the range, looking at the data points from the simulations, the range of validity for W was not that big, and you explained this is related to the PK number, fine. But in fact, looking at the two others, uh, LZ and, 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 and temperature, I got the impression, maybe wrongly, that the agreement was much better, which for LZ would be OK. But since the temperature scales as a product, I would have expected the same kind of you know, limited range for the temperature if, if, the, if for W, you know, the, the, the range of validity is limited as well. So the quick answer is yes, we've been surprised by the same thing, is <laughs> that somehow the temperature, the scaling fits better than the other two. Um, what we need mm. to get a much bigger range is larger Reynolds number simulations, right? Our code is reasonably limited in terms of the Reynolds numbers it can do. If anybody has a code that can go to much higher Reynolds number, I'd love to collaborate and redo all of this at you know twice or three times the Reynolds number. And then we could see whether what you're saying continues to hold. Uh, I suspect, you know, you, you have this, the, the, the difference between the, the scaling is not very big. It's the difference between minus a third and minus a quarter, which you can't really tell, right? Uh, with a limited range. Uh, mm -hmm. I think with a bigger range, we'll be able to get to the bottom of, is the temperature really continues to scale perfectly even when it's not supposed to be, or can you see the difference? I, I don't okay. know if it's a very satisfactory answer, but for the moment, it's more of a coincidence, I think, until I'm convinced there's something. The next to... talk, I guess. Yeah, it will be for the next talk, I guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Okay, uh, Guillaume. Um, well, thanks a lot. Very interesting. Do, do you have any reason to believe that uh, those shear instabilities um, would be would be depending on the region uh, on regions of the store of the stellar uh, interior uh, because what I understand of the type of plan is well uh, you need to have that shell layer but you also need to explain that it is thin and it remains thin right so uh, uh, would uh, would those uh, shear uh, instability arguments uh, be different depending on where you are inside the sun, or do you have any idea of, of mechanisms that would prevent the, uh, the spread of, of the momentum that you would be generating? There, there mm -hmm. are so many directions towards answering your question, I'm not sure where to start. Um, the first one is, anybody who knows me, you know, I, I worked with Douglas Goff, and so the model that he proposes is this internal magnetic field that does the 
tackle client confinement. So in, in some sense, I'm facetiously using the tackle client as an excuse to do these horizontal shear calculation when I actually think there's a magnetic field in there. But never mind. Let, let's assume there's no magnetic field doing any of this. Then you have the, the Zahn model, uh, the Spiegel and Zahn model, that also finds tackle client confinement. And for that, they only need a sufficiently large ratio between the vertical diffusivity and the horizontal diffusivity of the turbulence. With a sufficiently large ratio, they end up being able to also obtain tachocline confinement from that, right? From a purely hydrodynamical model. Um, in the paper that we wrote, we actually argue that our model for turbulence doesn't support the Spiegel and Zahn argument because the ratio is not in the right direction. Um, but technically, with the, the right amount, with the right type of turbulence, you can also confine the tachocline that way. Now, a third answer, which I think is the more relevant one here, is that in the sun you have rotation, which I've completely ignored so far, right? And what rotation does is it can stabilize the horizontal shear because there's angular momentum conservation that acts as a stabilizing factor, and so. In the region of the upper tachocline, the shear remains unstable, but if you go further below, the rotation can stabilize the latitudinal shear. So what you might end up is a partition system where the upper part of the tachocline has a lot of horizontal shear, but the lower part is actually stable to the horizontal shear, which might also be a reason why you have a thin tachocline for some reason or another, right? So, and, and so the, the more general answer to your question, in stars, I think, whether angular momentum stabilizes your horizontal shear or not is going to be a big part of the problem, right? Because you're not going to get these horizontal shear instabilities everywhere because of rotation. Sorry, that was a lot of different effects to take into account, sorry. Does that answer your many questions, Graham, or your question with many answers? Oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I knew there was no good answer, but uh, I'm trying to understand better. Thanks. This is astrophysics. It's never a good answer. Pat, did you have another question again? I mean, I, I did. I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of almost a verbal association game. So we have rotation and magnetic fields and, and, and shear. So you wonder where has some, some analog or manifestation of the MRI gone and where that might fit into the puzzle for, you know, for horizontal shearing processes? Because that, of course, doesn't require much of a magnetic field to, uh, to do things. Um. Again, I, I can't answer that very quantitatively. I know that uh, people like Kristen Manu has been looking at the MRI in the tackle client, there's been some work on that, but I don't know if anybody has actually done numerical simulations of the MRI in the tackle client. Steve, you might know that better than I do. Uh, well, yeah, there's been, well, okay. I don't know if you'd call it the MRI. There's certainly been an awful lot of research on joint instabilities of magnetic fields and differential rotation in the in the solar tachy client. So there's been a lot of work by Cali, Paul Cali, and uh, <laughs> collaborators looking at, looking at exactly that. Uh, well, so I mean, the, origi the original it, problem was looked at linearly by uh, Gilman and Fox. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's numerical of the MRI specifically, right? Because um, because one of the one of the upshots of, of Kristen calculation is that yes, possibly the MRI is relevant, but I don't know if anybody's actually looked at it with the tackle line in mind. Because the, the stratification, of course, is going to uh, have a big effect on the MRI in that context. Yeah, yeah. So P Peter Gilman has looked at. Uh, MRI type instabilities in global models, but linearly, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you say joint instability, though, it still comes down to effectively sheared rotation plus magnetic field. Yeah, when I say joint, what I mean is that the differential rotation on its own is stable, but when you add a magnetic field, everything goes unstable. Ah, ah, ah. A close so enough it's a bit for work. It's yeah. a bit MRI like in that sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody, Graham, you still have your hand up, but is that just you've forgotten to put it down? Uh, I just forgot. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So if there's no further questions, 
and uh, I can't see any. Let's thank Pascal again for a great talk and uh, I think we'll return tomorrow. Thanks, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you.